lecture. All right. So let me start by introducing tonight's speaker, Claire Bellergeau, currently serves as a historian and director of education at the Raynham Hall Museum in Oyster Bay, New York, and has been researching the Townsend family and their slaves for over 16 years, including curating a year-long exhibit on the Townsend Slave Bible in 2005. In 2015, during a research visit to the New York Historical Society, she discovered what may be one of the earliest poems ever written by Jupiter Hammond, America's first published African-American writer. She has spoken internationally and published several articles in scholarly journals about life and artifacts of colonial New York. Um, and I'll be dropping in the chat, but there is a link where if you would like a signed copy of the book, you can do so there. Um, and with that said, I am going to turn it over to Claire. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's really great to be with everyone tonight and especially to be here for Francis Tavern, which is one of my favorite places in the world. When I think about the story that you're gonna hear tonight of Robert Townsend as the spy in the Culver Spy Ring and about this woman, Liz, you know, I imagine them walking right outside of Francis Tavern when the war was uh, in happening and the culprit spiring was underway, they were here. And so I walk across, you know, the cobblestones and, and I imagine that I'm walking right in their steps. And um, so I get very excited when I think about Francis Tavern and all the history there, and it just fits so perfectly into tonight's talk. So it's a, a real thrill for me to be here tonight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just keep talking uh, about what I care so much about this book. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen and giving you some visuals so that you can follow along with what I'm saying. And so I'm gonna make this thing start at the beginning. There we go. So like I said, I'm really happy to be here tonight and I'm so glad that you've joined us. Um, the name of my book is Espionage and Enslavement in the Revolution, the true story of Robert Townsend, who you may know from the Culper Spy Ring, and a woman named Elizabeth, whose nickname was Liz. My co-author is Tiffany Yecky Brooks. She wasn't able to join us tonight, but I just want to give her a shout out. She's an amazing professional writer who helped me with this book. And I also have the foreword in the book by Vanessa Williams, um, the famous singer, performer, actress, Vanessa Williams. Um, she didn't just fall in love with Lissa's story. She's actually part of it too. Her ancestors live in the same town where Liss was born, Oyster Bay. And those ancestors can uh, trace their history back to the era when slavery was legal in New York. And so to tell you this story, I have to explain the world that Liz and Robert lived in. And so Liz was born around 1763. She was born into slavery, a slave of the Townsend family. And that home is now a museum called Raynham Hall Museum that you can come and visit. And I really hope you do. Um, if you came during the week, I would likely be there and would be very happy to show you around. And so it's extraordinary to discover the life of a person who I hope will become an American founding figure and for her already to have a birthplace museum already in place. Now, the world she was born into had legal slavery in every one of the 13 colonies. Um, the colony she was born into specifically, New York, actually had more slavery than any other Northern colony. So in 1770, when she was just a kid, if you added up all the slavery in all of the New England colonies combined, New York had much more. It had much more than Pennsylvania, which is geographically around the same size, and if you look all the way down at the bottom of this map at Georgia in 1770, New York had more slavery than Georgia. Now, decades before Liz was born, there was a law put in place in New York that all towns must have an official paid slave whipper. Our town, Oyster Bay, 
had many of these over the years. And when I looked in the Oyster Bay Town record book, there were their names, the official town Negro Whippers. In fact, Oyster Bay had one all the way back in 1714 before the law was enacted. And so the whipping post, like you see on the side, would have been something that towns would have had in a public place. Last year, I discovered a chilling record in this Oyster Bay blacksmith's book. And this blacksmith's record is from 1802. It was a digitized record, so I was able to really zoom in on this little tiny blue dot that I'm indicating down here on the page, which read, putting a band and bolt on a black, three wearing irons and one ring. This was a blacksmith being paid to shackle an enslaved black person. There was a much harsher record a little deeper in this book in 1808. The same blacksmith, Daniel McCoon, being paid to strap a black person for a beating, for a welt, to a wagon tire. This torture of beating a person on a wagon wheel goes back to medieval times. It's called breaking on the wheel. And to think that in 1808, this was happening on Long Island in the middle of the public square in Oyster Bay. There were runaway slave ads in almost every edition of New York newspapers of this era. And this is just one of them. I chose this one because it mentions Oyster Bay where Liz was born. And it talks about a man named Isaac and describes him very exactly. He's five feet, 10 inches high, well-made, middle-aged. It says he's very ragged. His coat is light and patched with different colors. He's pockmarked, meaning he's survived the smallpox and has the scars on his face. It says he's resided in Oyster Bay about a year, passing himself as a free person and giving himself a last name, Johnston. Now, Robert Townsend was born into the same exact town, the same exact house in 1753, but he was born into a very wealthy family of shipping merchants. This isn't the Townsend family in this painting, but it's a period painting for you to see. Now, they were a family of 10, and he had four other brothers and three sisters in his family. But Robert became the most famous in modern times because handwriting analysis in the 1920s showed that he was the spy Cole Culper Jr. So in his day, he wasn't well known like some of his other brothers and sisters who were more prominent than he was. But in modern times, he's the one that we remember the most. And just a word about some of the artistic portraits that you might see. This image of Robert is an artist's interpretation. The image that you'll see of Liss is also an artist's interpretation. Liss, of course, would not have ever had her portrait done as an enslaved person, and Robert chose not to have his portrait done. And these would have been the stories that our museum would have always told. The story of a patriot father, a spy son, the Culper spy ring, how the British took over Long Island and occupied our town and lived in our house. That would have been a lot of story to tell. And we would have kept telling it like that forever, except that in 2005, the phone rang. It was an auction gallery, Swan Galleries from New York City calling us to say they had a Bible that was going to be auctioned off, that we should get a donor ready. We were gonna wanna buy this Bible. First, we didn't understand why, but then we realized, yes, we do need to buy this Bible and we did buy it for $10,000. We would have paid any amount of money, I think, for this piece of evidence of our story. It was... It was a small document, this, this gave us tons and tons of information, especially names like Jeffrey, Catherine, Lily, Susanna, Harry, Susan, Rachel, Violet, Hannah, another Susanna, Marianne, Jane, and Gabriel. And 
other parts of this record told us when they were born down to the day. Some records of when people died and even for Susanna, how she died of smallpox. It also told us how people were related to one another, especially mothers of children. And on a second page, we heard about Nancy, Kate, Jim, and Josh, and about their parents, Gabriel and Jane. But especially we learned that Samuel Townsend was the owner of these people. They were his slaves. And it was our Samuel Townsend of Oyster Bay, Long Island. Now, at the time when we bought that Bible, I did a year long exhibit about it and started collecting other research. Over the 16 years of my research, I uncovered other people. I found unique individuals, but their records didn't include their name. So I call them the unnamed child and the unnamed man. Almost all of these records were singular points in time. Sometimes a person would have one or two records, but nothing like Liss. Liss's story had a real arc. It followed her life through a whole incredible journey. And as I said, this image is not really what Liss looked like. It's an artist's interpretation but I wanted to have a face to look at. I wanted to know more about Liss. And that 16 year journey led me to write the book that I've mentioned. Claire. Ironic, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, your yes. sound keeps going in and out. Oh no. And then there was a there was a thicker black piece on top of the screen that was oh, dear. some of the text as well. Oh gosh, um, hmm. Yes, I'll say your video is frozen as well, although we can't see you too much. Oh my gosh. Uh -oh. um, it's storming okay. in New York if you're not here with us, uh, which is probably behind a lot of this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's have a momentary pause as we get this back online. It's showbiz. <laughs> It's like live theater, uh, but horrible because I can't do anything because I'm in my house and she's in her house. Um, to answer a question I see in the chat, yes, uh, the museum is in Oyster Bay. It is Raynham Hall. It's a historic house uh, museum. And if you're in the area of Long Island, I think that you should probably enjoy it if you can go visit when you're able to. All right. Yes, I'm seeing some endorsements in the chat. The museum is the best. <laughs> Claire, we're getting suggestions that you may be best just to turn off your video to save the bandwidth, especially if there's a storm coming through. Oh, ooh, there she is. I see you. Okay, she's back. I'm back. And can you see me and hear me now? Yes. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. And it's not breaking up now? No. Oh my goodness. So sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, let, me, let me share my screen again and I'll make sure that I back up a few slides. How's that? Sounds good. Oh my goodness. There you go. So I'm gonna go, oh, okay. Okay, well, here we go, guys. This is Zoom. This is what happens. <laughs> this is the world of Zoom that we were living in for some time, right? Oh, yes. And, oh, it's, yeah. oh, and it's never predictable. <laughs> yeah, I'm not used to this happening. 
Okay. And they say history is boring. <laughs> exactly. History is not boring, is it? History is not boring. Okay, so <laughs> I was just saying All right. that there were twice as many enslaved people as members of the Townsend family. Now you can fully see my screen now, right? Good, excellent. And so the museum added a slave's quarters room to be a counterpoint to the fancy rooms where the family lived and to make sure that visitors really had a chance to think about how they would have lived in the house. Um, we don't have specific documents that show this was the room, but there's a small, very steep, narrow staircase at the end of the room that leads down to where the colonial kitchen would have been. And above this room is an attic where they may also have lived. We have a dirt basement in this building where they may have lived. And also outbuildings and barns we know were on the property where they were uh, having fields and agricultural work was happening. And so this is a story not about the Civil War and not about the South. It's about the North in the Revolutionary War. It's about New York, Manhattan, Long Island. And I invite people to make room in that founding story for Liz and for the other people who were enslaved with her. Now, our founding story in many ways uh, starts with the father, Samuel Townsend. In 1775, he joined a group called the New York Provincial Congress. This group was like a satellite of the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. And they were meeting at places like Francis Tavern, honestly. They were coming into the city and having meetings, trying to plan the revolution. But the majority of Long Islanders were loyalists. So they were all sworn to a solemn oath of secrecy, not to talk about anything they might've been saying in one of the private Francis Tavern back rooms, right? They didn't want anyone to find out what they were up to. Now, that kind of ended with the Declaration of Independence because now we were declaring no more secrets. We wanna be our own free country. We wanna be the United States of America. And for Long Island, that declaration only lasted one month because near the end of August, we had a group of warships gathering off of Staten Island, British and Hessian warships that were so many masts that they said it looked like a forest. As this battle in Brooklyn, uh, called the Battle of Brooklyn or the Battle of Long Island was just heating up, Samuel Townsend had a different job. He was with General Nathaniel Woodhull in Jamaica, Queens. General Woodhull couldn't enter this battle because literally he didn't have enough men. He needed two regiments of soldiers. He knew exactly which regiments he wanted. That would equal 500 men. And he sent a letter with Samuel Townsend in to find Washington and tell him, please send me these troops. Washington was a little wishy-washy. He was like, well, I don't know. I'll try, I'm not sure. And a series of these letters go back and forth as Woodhull gets more desperate, saying he is literally being surrounded. Finally, Washington instructs Samuel Townsend to find Woodhull and not give him anything written down, but to give him this audible message. I'm abandoning you. I'm sorry. I have to abandon Long Island. And by then, General Woodhull was literally surrounded by British troops who, so the legend says, told him to say, God save the king. And instead he said, God save us all. And these members of Delancey's brigade struck him on the head and on the shoulder with swords. He was not given medical attention and he would later die from those wounds. Now, spoiler alert, the battle of Long Island was lost. General Woodhull died from his wounds and now, all of Long Island and all of New York City were overtaken by the British. We were now all living behind enemy lines. And so everyone in Long Island had to just be the Brit British resting grounds. And in New York City, it was even worse. New York City became British headquarters. And so we had one after another British regiments come into Oyster Bay, occupy the town and make the house the headquarters of the regiment and have the commander billet himself inside of a room in the house. And the most famous of these was this guy, Colonel John Graves Simcoe. 
he commanded a group called the Queen's Rangers. And I just love this picture of the reenactors here. They're showing off something very interesting about the Queen's Rangers. They did not wear red coats. They wore green. Colonel Simcoe was such a good military tactician, he knew the value of camo. And he would have had his daily officers meetings right here in our parlor. And he had some other interesting things to know about him. Now he's been portrayed in shows like Turn as a real villain, as the enemy. But actually the family said of all of the commanders who stayed in their house, he was the most honorable. And part of that honor was his belief that slavery was morally wrong. Before he was given command of the Queen's Rangers, he actually wanted to raise a regiment and take into battle escaped American slaves, but he wasn't allowed to do that. Now, after the war, he became the governor of Upper Canada. He founded the city of Toronto and he passed the first anti-slavery laws in Canada in the 1790s. They still celebrate Simcoe Day every August in Canada to thank him for ending slavery and for founding Toronto. So he actually was staying in this bedroom that we've dressed up in our museum to look like this, quite a nice little apartment with lots of room. And he invited a friend to come and stay for a little vacation in March of 1779. If you're as much of a Revolutionary War geek as I am, you already know this guy, Major John Andre. He and Simcoe were very close friends. They had billeted together in Staten Island earlier in the war. They had fought together in British uh, battles in Pennsylvania. And when Simcoe came to live in this nice house in this friendly town, Andre wanted to come too. Of course, he wasn't just a friend. He was the British spy master. He was in charge of all of the intelligence gathering on the British side. So imagine Liss in this circumstance. She would have had to do all of the service to these men who were living in her household besides her regular duties as an enslaved person. She would have had closer contact to Simcoe and Andre than any of the towns and teenage daughters would have done. She would have been making his bed, cleaning his chamber pot, tightening his bed strings. And perhaps he was talking to her about how he felt about slavery. Later on in documents that Robert wrote, he describes Liss in this way, that she was too fond of the British officers and too fond of company. Now it might be that Simcoe talked to her in a way that for the first time in her life made her feel seen, gave her personhood, he may have told her that the British were soon going to offer escaped American slaves their freedom if they would come over to the British side. Now, just about the same time when Simcoe was making himself at home in the Townsend House in late 1778, a spy ring was forming, beginning with a man named Abraham Woodhull, a cousin of that fallen general. He lived way out on Long Island in Suffolk County in Setauket, and he was coming into New York City to gather intelligence and report back to Washington. Now, he wrote about someone he describes of as a faithful friend that he would get a lot of good intelligence from in 1778. Now, I can't exactly prove it was Robert Townsend, but it's likely that it was. Robert was renting a room from Abraham Woodhull's sister. And this made it quite easy for Abraham Woodhull to come into the city, say he was visiting his sister, go down the hall, knock on Robert's door. And this person who he described of as a first character of the city would give him intelligence. Now, fast forward to the spring and Simcoe and his Queens Rangers left Oyster Bay and Liss escaped with them. So somehow Liss joined into this group of wagons and horses and soldiers. Did she secret herself in a box as I'm showing you from an illustration from much later in time? We don't actually know, but Simcoe did make a purchase from Samuel Townsend right before he left with Liss. He bought two large hinges, two large H hinges and a quantity of nails. So maybe he made a 
little trap door in one of his wagons. We don't know. But we do know this. Eight days later, Robert Townsend, the spy who would be called Culper Jr. at this time, wrote his father a letter. And he said, the Queen's Rangers are now beyond Kingsbridge. Kingsbridge was the very top of Manhattan where a physical bridge was. He says, when I see any of the officers, we'll make inquiry for Lys. But I think there is no probability of your getting her again. Believe you should reckon her among your other dead losses. I'm surprised that Colonel Simcoe would permit her to go. He certainly must have known it when they left Oyster Bay. Now it's interesting that he doesn't say to his father, you should put a runaway slave ad in the paper and I'll help collect the reward money for you and, and vet people as they report on where she is. He's basically saying, I know where she is. I'm watching the Queen's Rangers as they go north and just give up on her, you know, don't even uh, count her as one of your possessions anymore. Now, Liz did not stay with the Queen's Rangers. She actually came to Manhattan and was re-enslaved by a British officer, somebody whose name we do not know, but he was somewhere right in Manhattan, right where Robert was. And right about this same time, Robert is now the lead spy. He's now going to be called Culper Jr. Abraham Woodhull is going to be called Culper Sr. And he writes letters like this one saying, I have received your dictionary and will be glad to have the stain as soon as possible. When shall endeavor to find some shorter route to forward my letters? Because the Culper spies went the long way around. Often by the time Washington got their letters, it was old news. But if they had gone the short way, they surely would have been caught. Now the dictionary he means is this long list that Benjamin Talmadge, our American spy master, wrote out for the spies. He literally took a dictionary, wrote out all the important words, and then assigned them each a number. The stain that he mentions in that letter is the American's invisible ink invented by John Jay's brother, Sir James Jay. This was a two-part um, chemical. One part they called the stain would completely disappear on clean white paper. And the other liquid called the counterpart would make your message reappear. And so Robert is assembling his own uh, circuit of informants. He's collecting his own information and using these methods, writing down these secret letters. Now, not long after Liss came to town and Robert became the lead spy, the other spy, Abraham Woodhull, mentioned just a singular time, a 355, who shall be able to outwit them all. 355 was the number for the word lady. And he describes this lady as someone who is his acquaintance and who has some secret ability to outwit the British. Now, of the 190 plus Culper spy letters that we still have, mostly at the Library of Congress, 355 is only mentioned once. And honestly, Abraham Woodhull should have never even mentioned her once. You're not supposed to write about your fellow spies, but we'll never probably know who she was. But I would like to set forth this idea that it might have been Liz. She at least should be considered among the possibilities of people who might have been assisting them. Now, Robert, you'll remember, told his father to write off Liz and that he would never get her back. But Robert knew exactly where she was and twice in his ledger books at the time when he was a spy, bought her things. He bought her tea in the upper record and on the bottom one, a thimble and thread. So he had contact with her, at least a little bit of contact during this spy time for him. And right at the middle of this time, in the fall of 1780, Benedict Arnold's treason plot unraveled. Now, Benedict Arnold, as most of you know, was plotting to give up the fort at West Point. And the spy, John Andre, was having secret meetings with him in the woods near West Point. At the final meeting, or one of the final meetings, Andre was captured in the woods by the Americans, who intended to rob him. When he had no money on him, they stole his boots instead and out fell the plans to West Point Fort. So Andre was captured, but Benedict Arnold got away. 
When Benedict Arnold got away, he came right down to New York City. So you can imagine him walking outside Francis Tavern or maybe going in the tavern to have a drink. And Robert was terrified. He said in one of his culprit spy letters, I am happy to think that Arnold does not know my name. But Arnold rounded up at least 40 suspected spies, many of whom Robert knew, spies like Hercules Mulligan, who were arrested and interrogated. So Robert got out of town. He had originally had his store here in Hanover Square, right down in the center of, the, of New York City at the time. But when he left, he was gone for about three months. When he came back, he dissolved his partnership with his business partner there and moved his business way over here to Peck Slip, which is now South Street Seaport. He stopped advertising his shop in the newspapers and he stopped writing Culper spy letters. After he came back and was so afraid that Arnold would catch him, he said that he would only meet with Woodhull outside of the city and give him audible reports. Now, we've come to the end of the war in 1782 and Lys's British master is going to evacuate and she did not want to go with him, probably headed to Canada. Lys came to Robert and asked him if Robert would repurchase her and he agreed to do this. The other reason why she might have wanted to stay in New York is because Lys was three months pregnant. Three months pregnant. Now, right after she came to live with him at Peck Slip, he wrote his final spy letter and hand delivered it to Benjamin Talmadge in Westchester. And then a few months after that, she gave birth in his bachelor's quarters to a baby I believe was a boy named Harry. Uh, Robert would later describe Harry as mulatto or mixed race. So who is Harry's father? We do not know. Uh, Robert gave Harry a lot of attention and care over the years, uh, and he may have been the father, or he may just have been a person who was present at his birth and who cared about what happened to him. Now, Robert, meanwhile, had decided that he did not believe slavery was moral. He did not want to own a slave. And Liss knew a woman who did want to own her, a widow, a recent widow named Anne Sharwin. Though he would later really regret it, Robert agreed to sell Liss and baby Harry, who was about six months old, to this widow, Anne Sharwin. But he made uh, an agreement with her that if she ever wanted Liss to leave the city or if she ever wanted to move away, to recontact Robert and to tell him and he would buy Liss and Harry back for the same price. Now, Robert thought that this verbal agreement was settled and he really stopped paying attention to what was going on with this situation. Uh, one year later, this widow remarried a wealthy merchant named Alexander Robertson. That's actually his profile there in the picture. Alexander Robertson's wedding to Anne Sharwin was over as soon as it began. He, it seems, gave Liz some unwanted attention, which caused a derangement and separation in this new marriage. And the marriage was over within just a few days. Now, maybe for spite or maybe for money, he had control of Liz and Harry. He kept the baby who was about two years old at that time and sent Liz, resold her to a man in Charleston, South Carolina. And what a horrible voyage that must have been for her. What a terrible place for her to have been sent. And as far as Liz knew, nobody knew she was down there and nobody was going to save her. The ship she went down on was called the Brig Lucretia and it was captained by a man whose name runs chills down my spine, Captain Tinker. He was well known in New York City because he had a side business of kidnapping free blacks in New York City and tricking them onto his boat, knocking them unconscious. And when they would wake up, they would be in Charleston on the auction block. He did this to so many people that they started putting warnings in the New York newspapers like this one that you see, which reads a hint. Now riding in this harbor on the Sloop Maria, Captain Tinker will probably sail for Charleston in a day or two. 
She has on board a considerable number of Negroes. Some of these distressed objects were seen wringing their hands, praying to their relentless proprietors that they might be permitted to remain in New York. But by these hardened people, their petitions were treated with disdain. It would be well for free Negroes to be upon their guard, lest they should meet with some kidnappers and share the same fate that many heretofore have done. And it signed Benevolus, which was a pen name sometimes used by Benjamin Franklin. Now, Liss was not kidnapped at all because Liss had never been given her freedom. Liss was just cargo. She was down in the hold, right alongside the items you see in these ads, biscuits and kegs, a few barrels of apples, um, some produce, some Burlington hams and ship's bread, and Liss. Now, just as she was arriving, the same exact day that she arrived into Charleston, the Manumission Society of New York was holding its very first meeting. Robert Townsend would join the society shortly after that first meeting, and he would be a member alongside John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and even that spy we mentioned before, Hercules Mulligan. And this group, the Manumission Society, wanted to immediately end slavery by law. That was their mission, but they were unable to do it. They could not get the votes. Now the man that Liss was sold to down in Charleston had his own history in the Revolutionary War way back in 1770. This man who purchased her in Charleston was named Captain Richard Palms, and believe it or not, he was the instigator of the Boston Massacre of 1770. Every time you look at an image of the Boston Massacre, you'll usually see a man with a club raised. That's him. He struck a British officer with his cudgel, and then the bullets started flying. This man is now the new owner of Liss, and he had another interesting chapter to his life. Uh, John Adams had been one of the prosecutors in the trial of the Boston Massacre, got to know Richard Palms as a very burly and strong guy. And so when John Adams went to Paris to join Benjamin Franklin to help him negotiate with the French, Richard Palms served as his bodyguard and personally delivered John Adams and his son to Paris. Now, there were a lot of crazy coincidences like this in my book that people who were part of Liss's story just also happened to be doing really amazing, famous things. And here's another one. It's almost too much to believe, but just when John Adams and Richard Palms were in Paris meeting with Benjamin Franklin, Robert Townsend's older brother, Solomon, was there too. Believe it or not, in the same time span, he was meeting with Franklin to get this, an oath of allegiance to America, something that he needed to bring back to the United States to prove that he was a true patriot. Solomon and Captain Richard Palms came back to America in the same convoy. Now, Robert did eventually, after two years, find out that Liss was in Charleston, and he immediately started writing these letters uh, that were penned under both him and his brother Solomon's name to contacts, business contacts down in Charleston, people who he knew also shared his anti-slavery beliefs. These letters are at the East Hampton Library, and they're just fascinating. They're, they're chock full of amazing information about Liss's story. Now, I believe that Liss was brought back by one of those men named Adam Gilchrist, but the anti-slavery group, that New York Manumission Society, wasn't making it easy. They had, since Liss had gone down to Charleston, made it illegal for a slave to be brought across state lines into New York. So Liss actually had to be smuggled back to New York because it was illegal for her to come back. Now, I do believe that she did come back. The evidence of her life after her return is very thin and scattered, but here's one little piece. This is a 1789 Baptist church record from Oyster Bay. And right across from Samuel Townsend's name is Elizabeth, a black woman. This record doesn't speak to her status. Is she a free person? Is she still enslaved by Samuel Townsend? His wife and daughter Sally appear on the next page. 
And this is a great confirmation for people that might have heard that the Townsends were Quakers, that they were in fact Baptists. Then I found another very scant evidence that probably is Liss, I really hope it is her, in the 1790 census of the town of Oyster Bay. She's listed, hopefully it's her, as Free Elizabeth, as a paid servant in the household of David Richard Floyd Jones. David Richard Floyd Jones had just inherited 8,000 acres, including what's now Jones Beach and all of Massapequa. And he had inherited this, an enormous mansion called Fort Neck House. All of this acreage and this mansion were going to be attainted, that is to say seized by America because the owner was a loyalist. But Samuel Townsend in his last years as a member of the New York State Senate helped pass the legislation so that David Richard Floyd Jones could instead inherit all of this. And if she was the servant listed in the census, here's the living room, the great room where she would have been working as a paid servant. You can just imagine her winding that clock or dusting those frames. There are even WPA project photographs of the inside of this grand house, which unfortunately burned to the ground in the 1950s. I can just see Liz walking up that floating staircase or going through those arched doorways. But after that 1790 census, I lost sight of her. She had no last name. I don't know if she ever took a last name. She was listed in the 1790 census because she was a single woman. If she got married or became part of another man's household in the 10 ensuing years before the next census, only the husband's name would be listed and a woman would strictly be a number in the column next to the husband's name. I do know this though, in 1827, after 201 years, slavery finally ended in New York and the day it ended was July 4th. So when you celebrate July 4th next year, please think of it also as Emancipation Day in New York. So this is where I'm gonna leave you with these stories, these people, these places. I hope that you'll be able to see the Revolutionary War through her eyes and also have a deeper understanding of Robert Townsend who really struggled as he had anti-slavery beliefs in a world that required him to be part of the institution of slavery. Um, I'm hoping that you've got some great questions. I'm gonna turn off my presentation now and see what kind of comments or questions you might have to share. That was wonderful, Claire. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, just to say thank you to pointing out diverse stories and giving us a much more fuller and complete version of colonial and revolutionary life is always very important. Um, I have a question. You were showing that portrait of Liz and you had said that it wasn't made of her. So where did it come from? I commissioned an artist to paint it for me. Oh. Um, I really needed to have a visual, both for my book and also just for myself. Yeah. So I uh, commissioned a young woman named Lindsay Levine and she was recommended to me through a friend who I really trusted, who was an artist who said she was really good. And I talked to her, I showed her documents about Liz. I talked to her about my feelings about her. And this was the portrait that she did. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I have to ask yeah. your thoughts on Turn? Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm really grateful to Turn because so many more people are interested in the Culper Spiring now. Yes, definitely. I do get a little frustrated because as I give tours at Raynham Hall to people, who are really excited about turn, I have to like correct the, a lot of it. So I feel bad about that part. Yeah. You know, um, they really made Simcoe out to be a bad guy, like super bad. I was um, gonna say. <laughs> they also showed the Townsends as Quakers. And I understand that a lot of authors mistakenly thought that. So maybe that wasn't their fault, but they're not. <laughs> they also really emphasized that Robert worked for James Rivington and he did not. Uh, he was not part of Rivington's Gazette, Printery, or Rivington's Coffee House, or a tavern. He actually, in one of his Culper spy letters, said that Rivington was trying to out the spies in New York. And so he was warning his fellow spies, 
hey, read that article in Rivington's Gazette. I think he knows that we've got a spy ring in the city, so we better be careful. So that sure wasn't his partner. There's also no money that ever was exchanged between them. Yeah, we often have to debunk a few turn rumors at the museum as well because of our Talmadge connection. So. Yeah, well, one of the big uh, <laughs> legends that really caught fire and they really focused on it in turn is the idea of Anna Strong and that she was a woman in Setauket that had a clothesline that was a code to mm -hmm. the spies. But actually that's just a legend. There's no primary documents that support it. And just the way that the spies did operate, they never used a drop box. And uh, Caleb Brewster was out on Long Island Sound a lot of times at night. I just don't think he could have seen the clothesline, honestly. Right. So anyway, it's not the best on Anna Strong too much, but it doesn't <laughs> seem plausible to me. Yeah, the more you focus on it, the more, I mean, even when I have to do some research on 355 when we, when we talk about the Culper spy ring, I'm just like, there's so many different possibilities and it's wonderful that it, you at least know that there was a woman that was part of it in a, in a pretty large capacity. So yeah, at least you awesome. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the slideshow that you played earlier? Because I was trying to look at all the illustrations and I recognize some of them. So do you want to tell everybody what that was? And yeah, I mean, out? my computer is so chock full. I've been doing this research for 16 years and I just love these documents that sometimes a document will just be a little tiny crumb. But to mm -hmm. me, it's so interesting. And, and in a way, those documents are really beautiful. So I just dumped them all into a PowerPoint, hit fade for the transition and found a nice piece of music. Because to me, every time I just even look at it, I get excited. And yeah, I was, I was trying to watch it and I was like, I know that one. I know that one. Which one was that one? So are they all, yeah, are they all in the book? And uh, no, the, oh. the book publishers only gave me a few illustrations in the middle. <sighs> Sorry. Get it. <laughs> oh, you know where you can find a lot of them though? And why they're important? On my website, which is the name of the book.com, espionage and enslavement.com, there's a timeline that I put on there because it's impossible to tell you everything, you know? And the timeline is incomplete too. Yeah. But the timeline has a lot of information on it that might be fun for people to look at either who have already read the book or who are thinking of reading the book and they just want to know more. Yeah, there's always more to be known. So you showed that family Bible and of course you were like, of course we bought it, but was there anything else that was oh, like important or so the important. Whole, every single page, every single page, every single line was like amazing and informative and so necessary? Well, even more than you'll, you'll even understand until I explain something else. That record was all written by one person on one day with one pen. <gasps> it's not a bunch of entries like you would think a Bible would be. And so the last date is 1795. So it had to have been written either in 1795 or after. And so that was the time when Robert Townsend administered his deceased father's estate, which included 12 slaves. One of the things that you had to prove in order to manumit a slave was ownership and age. And he didn't have any documents like that. So I think that that bubble page might have been a way that he was creating a record so he could help manumit slaves that belonged to his father's estate. And also to give Harry, who was now almost old enough to manumit, a background story because he couldn't really write about Liss. She was illegally transported into New York. So in the Bible, he says Harry is the son of Jane, but the timing doesn't work. Harry can't be Jane's son once you dig into it enough. Wow. So it's interesting. What a great find. Yeah. It took me years to figure out what that thing meant. Yeah. But you feel a little better once you do, right? Exactly. <laughs> then you're like, oh, of course it makes sense now, right? Uh, Richard is asking any evidence Townsend or Liss had any contact with Hercules Mulligan, who was also uh, an enslaved holder. I don't have evidence about Liss, but I do have evidence about Robert. I have Hercules Mulligan coming into Robert's store and buying things from him. And then I also have Robert going to Hercules Mulligan's store and buying a suit of clothes from him. So they definitely knew each other through business. And as I showed in the slides, they were both members of the New York Manumission Society at the same time. So they had a lot of contact. Plus, they were both sort of like businessmen of many years in the same area. 
Um, so I'm sure that they did know each other very well. Did they know that the other one worked as a spy? That I don't know. That I don't know. I wonder if they were just kind of like winking to each other. Like, I need some more rum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, we had an exhibition on the Culper's firing a few years ago and it just kind of recently went down. And, you know, everybody would always ask, like, did they know each other? What was going on? How did they do these things? And I was like, I, I don't sometimes remember my own information. So I can't tell you if they knew all of the spies in New York City, because then that would mean that they were all really bad at their job if they all knew each other. I saw someone asking, when will the audiobook version be ready? And I wish it were ready right now. In fact, my contract says that I get to I get first dibs on reading it because oh. I used to do audiobooks professionally. So they better let me do it. But <laughs> um, the publisher hasn't set a date for that yet. And I also saw a question about Rivington. Was mm -hmm. he part of the spy ring? That I really have never been able to find evidence of, although his name is part of the Culper Code. And so... He could have been, but it's also likely that maybe that word Rivington was like Q-tip. It meant his paper because they always put a copy of the British paper in with their letters. And so that's possible too. I've never found any real evidence that he was at least not part of the Culper spy ring. Like I said, Robert actually wrote a, a spy letter where he says, look at what Rivington just put in his paper about how there are spies in New York. We better watch out because he knows that we're spies. So, yeah, I was under the impression that he was part of the the, the Culper spy ring because he stayed in New York after evacuation day, and that's like usually the biggest seller. But I was like, that doesn't also prove anything. He was actually viciously attacked, and his yeah. printing press was destroyed. So, I think he might have been trying to play both sides. It's hard to say. I don't know. It happens. You answer the question. Uh, e. Radley is asking. They would like to learn more about how enslaved people on Long Island were treated. Do you know of any books that would help? You know, I have found books that downplay it, and that really infuriates me. I found books that say, oh, people only had two slaves, one or two. I have never found records that, that lead me to think that's true. I've always found these larger quantities that people had. And like I said, the Townsend's 20 that I've discovered. And so... How they were treated is really hard to say, although we know about the whipping post law. Mm -hmm. We found records of the whipping post being repaired in our town, so we definitely know it was there. Um, those horrible blacksmiths records I found of people being shackled and beaten. You can look at runaway slave ads and you can see the harsh treatment and the injuries that enslaved people had. Um, some people were being branded on the face and things like that. So we don't know about specifics, but we do have some anecdotal examples and it's not good. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a story that needs to be told a little bit more. And yeah. I know people who are actively trying to do that, which is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lynn is asking, what do you know about the role of Governor Morris in, manu in Manumission Society and association with Robert Townsend? I don't know specifically about that connection, but if you read my book, you'll hear about an ancestor of Governor Morris, who you should find really interesting if you like that Morris storyline. Um, there were these two Morris brothers in the 1600s, and one of them lived in New York, and he had big land holdings, think Morrisania in the Bronx and uh, Morris County in New Jersey. And this, this brother, Richard, he died, his wife died right after him. And so all of his stuff, all of his land got given to his brother, Lewis Morris, who'd been in Barbados. So Lewis Morris came up to see all the things he'd inherited. And one of those things was an island right off of Oyster Bay called Hog Island, now Center Island, where Billy Joel lives and a bunch of other famous people. <laughs> and so when Lewis Morris came to Oyster Bay, he transferred ownership of a teenager who was enslaved an enslaved African-American boy who was 12 or 13, who still had an African name, Awa. Awa was bought by a Quaker woman named Alice Crabb. She took away his African name, gave him the name Tom. And when he was freed at her death in 1685, that record is looked at as the earliest known freeing of a slave on all of Long Island. Now, the property where he labored, the property Alice Crabb owned, 
is the property where Raynham Hall was built later. So our site where our museum is, is land where the first slave freed anywhere on Long Island labored as a slave. And he was walking right on the same ground where Liz walked when she was living and growing up. The That's crazy. Yeah, the misconnections that you don't quite know about is, is going to, to talk about Francis Tavern is, we know a lot of people who walked through there, but we can't confirm the same amount of like large clumps of founding fathers, but context clues and you're in New York City and Samuel Francis has the best food and this is where people were meeting and you're like, yeah, they probably came through these doors. So they probably met each other. You know, I think about not just Samuel Townsend having meetings inside your space, but I think about how after the meeting was over, he probably would go there for dinner with Robert and they would talk about all the things that were going on. I mean, I could just see it. I just imagine it in my mind's eye whenever I'm in there. It's the beauty of having a 300 year old building and yeah, ghosts right? who will always tell you that they are around. <laughs> to be a fly on the wall in those conversations would be a dream. We, we gotta, we gotta have time travel. Can't we just have time travel? <laughs> as long as I could be invisible, maybe. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your research process. So yes. you have all of these documents. It took you so many years and it's it's very clear that what you did is very thorough and the story is so compelling because of it and it's wonderful. I'm wondering as a fellow researcher, what was the best piece of information that you found that you were like, this is it, this is my story. This is the story that I need to tell about Liz. Like what was your moment? I, I'll never forget it. I was doing research on that Bible and I had reached out to different institutions that I knew had towns and family documents and to just broad question, send me anything that you have that relates to slavery. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't working at the museum full time at that time. So I was at another job and I get this message from a staff person. Something came through on the fax machine a couple of days ago. You should come over and see it. This was, that's how long ago it was faxes. <laughs> And so I go into the back room of the museum and I'm like, they were having an event. So I'm climbing over all these boxes of stuff to get to the printer where the fax machine was. And I pull up this picture, this page, because it was a photocopy that had then been faxed. It was almost unreadable. It was almost completely grayed out and, and just black smudges everywhere. But here, here's these letters about Liss being in, enslaved by palms. These are the letters that Robert wrote frantically to these people to try to save her and bring her back to New York. And I'm, I was sitting down on these back steps in the historic house, which had been the Irish servants in the Victorian period, their servant stairs. And I'm just absolutely astonished reading this. I just can't believe what I'm reading. And at that moment, I knew I could not give up on her. I could never stop looking for her story until I figured it out. Yeah. And that then that led me to the story about um, the Queens Rangers are now beyond Kingsbridge. That's when I realized that that was also about Liss because Elizabeth and Liss were actually the same person. Now, for decades at the museum, they had attributed that, that letter about Simcoe knowing that she escaped mm -hmm. to be about a cow. They said for decades that that was about the British stealing a cow. Oh, okay. Yeah, not about a cow. Definitely, no. No. But I mean, this was the sort of 1940s and 50s and 60s way of just whitewashing history, saying, you know, oh, this was, you know, just, there was nothing dark going on here, you know? And, and really, even though our index card of, of what we had in our archives, when I first started looking 16 years ago, there were no entries about slavery, but there were documents about slavery. They just had not been notated. They hadn't been recognized and really brought out. There was a lot more there than I realized when I started going digging. Yeah, once you dig and you start uncovering things, you're like, no, 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 not a cow. We're going to start changing things. Cow. This is Let's it. File on this one. Where? You know, um, I, really my process was haphazard because I'm not a professor of history. I don't have a degree in history. I just became obsessed with her story, and I was a pretty um, particular uh, keeper of records and, and organized in my file system. And I was also willing to go crazy places with my husband to look for documents like Ann Arbor, Michigan, Ontario, Canada, of course, Charleston and Columbia, South Carolina. So. 
I gave up many times, many times. I was like, that's it. I'll never find out what happened. I'll never get to the bottom of this. And then I would find one more thing and that would just keep me going. Yeah. And so eventually I, I was going to write a scholarly paper, but it was just very restrictive, the scholarly way of writing. And I realized this is a book. I want to be able to tell all the possible outcomes of this story and let the reader decide themselves what they think. And so if I had been a academic, I probably wouldn't have taken 16 years on one project, right? I would have written and published and written and published. And I mean, been. I've written the same thing many a times and I've continually added to it. And yeah. that basically sounds like me. So you are a historian. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise that, you know what? Thanks. No, you wrote a book, you did the work. It's incredible and it's moving. And there's so many people saying how amazing, what wonderful work. And this is, it truly is amazing. I mean, to be able to publish something on your own, first of all, is wonderful. So well, it was hard to get a publishing contract and hard to get a literary agent. And really my co-author, Tiffany Yecky Brooks was a big part of why I was able to do that. And what I came to realize was sometimes you have to give up some ownership. Sometimes you have to give away some power in order to achieve your goals. And so by bringing Tiffany in, that was a major uh, truth that I came to understand. She was a really great writer and she knew about the cult perspiring because she was the lead researcher of George Washington's Secret Six. That's how we met. She uh -huh. was the lead ghost writer for Brian Kilmeade's book. And so I knew that she was not only a woman and not only a mother, which I really needed her to be, but she was somebody who already knew a lot about the cult perspiring. So we were a good match. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I hope everybody goes out to buy Claire's autographed copies and support her because this was wonderful. Thanks. I will be asking my last question. Okay. Uh, I think I know the answer. Um, if you could dine with anybody at Francis Tavern, who would it be and why? <laughs> oh, it could be anybody. We always get an assortment of, of colonial to Can modern. Can I have two guests? So you can invite anybody you want. It's your Robert partner. and Liz. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and Liz does not have to do any of the cleaning or cooking. No, that's what Samuel Francis is eat. for. That's she can buy anything she wants on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> well, that thank you so much wonderful. again. This was absolutely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> great. Thank you, Claire, for that really, really great presentation and answers to our questions. Thank you, Mary, for facilitating our Q&A. And thank you everyone joining us at your homes. Uh, we are so happy to have you with us again for another lecture with Francis Tavern Museum. If you enjoyed tonight's lecture and want to stay up to date with our programs, you can join our mailing list at francistavernmuseum.org. There you will also find our social media accounts as well as our calendar of upcoming programs. Our next lecture is going to be on August 19th. You are able to register for it now if you want to join us. Thank you to those of you who have donated to the museum. Your generous support helps us fulfill our mission and keep providing these wonderful programs and sharing the history of the American Revolutionary Era with you. Uh, if you would like to make a donation, you can also do that on our website, francistavernmuseum.org. Um, I think that's it. So thank you for joining us at another Francis Tavern Museum lecture and spending your evening, afternoon, whatever time it is where you are with us. And we hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Bye.